So, good morning, everybody. I think we're going to jump in here. I'm Todd Probert it's from CACI. Uh, I run our national security and innovative solutions sector. I've got a bunch of our teammates and partners up here, and we're excited to talk about SIGINT, AI, and EW, where they're heading, and how we can harness them uh, to, to work against today's and tomorrow's threats. So uh, in the run-up for this, uh, this panel, I actually had my team and we sat down and I said, how do I start this? So how do we get into this? And, and you know, one of the guys in the back you know, said, hey, tell a joke. I said, all right, great. We're at a Navy conference. What do you got from a Navy joke? And one of the guys got up and they gave me a Navy joke. And I said, well, probably can't say that one in public, so we're not going to go there. <laughs> the next guy got up, said a joke. <clears throat> yeah, no, can't, can't go there either. And then, then the young lady got up and, and told a joke, and it was probably the most offensive of the lot, and we won't go there either. But um, you guys see us tonight. Uh, we've got a happy hour. I've got, I've got a whole new slew of, uh, of Navy jokes to, to kind of go over with you. But my conclusion is I can't tell a Navy joke that's, uh, that's, that's uh, appropriate for public consumption. So uh, we're, we're going to start that. That's really my, my lesson for the week on that. But uh, good jokes, so come talk. I, I was active duty uh, Marine Corps for eight years. So I have plenty of Navy jokes. <laughs> well, I had, I, had plenty of those. I had Army and, and Marine Corps and, and, uh, and Air Force jokes, and I figured those were too easy for uh, for this crowd. So, so working through it. But no. So let's uh, let, let's let's get going. Um, a little bit about me, right? So I've been at CACI for about a year and a half. Um, I'm fortunate enough to run a really diverse. Uh, actually, EW, SIGINT, AI, cyber business, and um, uh, super excited to talk about it. And we've got some of my team up here to, to kind of go in, into depth on that. I started my career out as, a, uh, as an Intel analyst, and I did about 10 years, uh, everything from working on console to doing hardcore analysis for, uh, for the IC and for other agencies uh, around the Beltway. Um, more recently, I, I spent 10 years at Raytheon. I, I ran one of Raytheon's four businesses, uh, engineering groups, I had about 10,000 engineers working intelligence type of things uh, for me. Uh, everything from software to SIGINT uh, to EW and uh, a lot of space applications as well. Uh, and, and then uh, my latter part of Raytheon, I ran a very large command and control space and intelligence business. So um, this is very familiar ground uh, for me uh, and very excited uh, to have this conversation and, and, and talk a little bit about what our team is up to. So uh, no surprise, that the topic uh, of the, the past year and a half and certainly the past month and a half is what our peer adversaries are doing and uh, what's happening in that space. And I, I think the, the one remarkable thing for me is that EW, SIGINT, uh, the, the, the just broad RF spectrum has become more of a topic of conversation. And, uh, I've spent many a day, and uh, we've had some conversations, obviously, this, this week as well. And the, the EW environment is a of grave concern for everybody. What's happening on the red side, but even equally so, uh, what emissions are coming out of blue, and and, and the you know the ability to to kind of look at it and, and and prosecute it and understand you know what what you look like, uh, and then understand what you're going to do uh, in the threat environment and how you're going to go work through that. Uh, and then the other big kind of telling point of uh, this conference, right, I, I haven't been here in a couple of years, but, you know, if you roll back maybe 10 years ago, you would not see uh, the confluence of, uh, of vendors and, and companies here that you do this year, right? So large presence from a software standpoint, large presence from a commercial standpoint, um, you know, 5G communications uh, driving all of that. Uh, and, and 10 years ago, it would have been really a, a big hardware show where folks were looking uh, to kind of drive the, the simple modalities of what a box could go present. So we're going to go talk uh, in, good, uh, in, 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 in good sense there. Um, I'm excited about this team. Uh, I do need to point out that uh, we had one late ad. Uh, COVID, COVID does, not, uh, uh, does not fare well on, on panels as well. So we've, uh, we've dropped our, uh, or we've substituted our, our Northrop uh, partner out uh, for, a, for a CACI partner, but uh, I'm sure Dennis over there is, is going gonna, is gonna to handle it aptly. So let's start this off. Um, I'm really, uh, I think I'm going to let you all introduce yourselves. So um, uh, can you guys describe your areas of expertise uh, and how it relates to the Navy and the topic that we're talking about today? So Ramon, let's start with you. Sure. I'm uh, Ramon Acosta. I've been with uh, CACI for uh, over 11 years. 
Uh, prior to CACI, I uh, held positions of CTO and uh, VP of Engineering at various startups, working on um, electronic design automation, uh, systems management for networking, uh, database management systems, so kind of a broad background in a, a number of technology areas. Uh, at CACI, I've been involved with various Navy and ONR R&D projects on uh, DCGSN, Classic Reach, uh, Red Falcon, uh, the C system. And currently, I'm uh, specializing in containers, container orchestration, uh, infrastructure as code, and uh, cloud computing uh, for open system architectures for signal processing. And how does that relate to the Navy's mission? Um, well, uh, y you know, the Navy, in many of the acquisitions we're z seeing these days, is heavily uh, emphasizing open system architectures, the ability to uh, integrate applications, basically best of breed applications from the government, third party providers, um, and uh, also heavy use of, of containers. So uh, all of these topics are, are very relevant for, uh, for the, you know, the Navy going forward. Excellent, thanks Ramon. So next we're going to move to Dan, and Dan's one of those, uh, those newcomers to the scene, but Dell's been a fantastic partner uh, and, and really a game changer when it comes to the compute side and, and how we put all of the data to information and then take it to a decision point. So Dan, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been with Dell Technologies U.S. Federal for uh, five years, and I have over 20 years experience working within the federal sector uh, to include eight years as a active duty Marine and six years working at the Marine Corps Network Operations and Security Command out of Quantico, Virginia. Um, I did a lot of uh, early uh, design and implementation for the Marine Corps Enterprise Network that supports, uh, supports our deployed forces. And uh, yeah, and that's where my experience plays in. Excellent. And then just to throw in, since then I've also done extensive work with the uh, NIST Cybersecurity Center of Excellence around several um, cyber concerns re related to hyperconverged infrastructure, 5G, all the future technologies that the Navy needs to go and win. Awesome, looking forward to talking about that. Let's go next to Dennis. Hello, my, my name is Dennis Giannoni. I work at CACI as a senior systems engineer. I've been with CACI for over 18 years now. Um, I have significant experience with combat systems integration for US Navy ships, including integration with CWIP, uh, I also have development experience with uh, active array, phased arrays, uh, including uh, air missile defense radar, dual band radars. Uh, I've also led a, uh, a team that actually developed the first Navy training simulator that was used for non-Aegis ships and it was deployed at all the schoolhouses. And uh, currently I'm specializing in virtual reality and augmented reality technologies that are used for, for the Navy for maintenance training, and also for actually doing maintenance on board the ships. Excellent, thanks Dennis. And last but certainly not least, Matt from SNC. Hi, I'm uh, Matt Johnson. I'm a senior principal software engineer. You're gonna have to excuse me for my Minnesota accent, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've been uh, with uh, SNC for about seven years now. I've been in industry for about 20. Um, so uh, I pretty much specialize in what I'm going to call next generation SIGINT and then enabling distributed operations or uh, remoting sensors. So something that I did recently was we took a, a traditionally manned tech ELINT system uh, that, that has about a 10 gigabit link between it and its operator you know, on board and figured out how to remote that to now, now a remote operator you know, via beyond line of sight link where we don't have anywhere near 10 gigs. You know, um, so I've worked on several DCGS programs. Uh, I'm a former radio room guy, so ARCs and DEMAs and uh, yeah, PRCs have written device controllers and you know operated those sorts of things. Uh, and then you know currently it's ultra wideband signal processing. You know we make a 16 gigahertz instantaneous stair that's fielded today. We're working on on shrinking that uh, precision DF. Yeah, so we're starting to dabble in, in AIML. Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. So I, I've got a bunch of prepared questions, but uh, we're gonna go through those. Um, but I, I'd like to make this as much a dialogue. If you see something you wanna kinda jump in on, you know, raise your hand, there's a couple of mics in the middle of the room. 
Uh, and then certainly at the end, uh, we'll, we'll go to the audience. And uh, I've got a couple of folks out there that I'm going to pick on if I don't get any questions in. So everybody should, uh, should have, a, uh, ha have a question ready just in case. We'll put you on the hot seat. Uh, so we're going to start with EW first, gentlemen. Um, where do you see the various technologies that support the Navy's EW mission heading in the next five years? Matt, why don't we start with you on that one? Sure. Um, so something that we're doing now, but I'm going to talk about how it kind of carries us into the future. We've embraced software-defined hardware enabled. You know, so we are using more commodity or uh, you know commercially driven technologies, and so we kind of in our SIGINT processing system. So we've realized kind of a common architecture, you know, or I'm going to call it a signals processing ecosystem that's really made up of software-defined radio, high-speed networking, uh, x86 commodity compute, specialized compute in FPGA or system on chip or GPU you know, some creative RF or flexible, you know, RF matrix and switching, and then depending upon, you know, kind of the, the environment that we're going into, storage. So you can take that architecture and it scales. You know, so if we have a very small form factor, I put it in a little box, right? If we have a whole room that we can use, we, uh, we fill up those, that room with those resources. But it also allows us to ride, so those individual pieces, software-defined radios, high-speed networking, right? When I'd think about just five years ago, right, 10 gig was a relatively new thing. Well, now we're using 100, 100 gig NICs, and we're filling the pipes up, right? So, for example, our, our 16 gigahertz instantaneous stare, we use 400 gig NICs in order to, in order to pass all that data. That's a, that's a crazy amount. So, and then RF system on chip, right, or just system on chip in general, where I think that's going to carry us, just not seeing what we're doing now, and the potential that it's got for the future, it's kind of amazing. Um, the other thing that I'm gonna point out, remember, software guy, DevSecOps certified. Um, so DevSecOps is now, it's becoming commonplace, and it really wasn't you know, that, you know, that, ma that many years ago. And it's enabling us to go so much faster, and now, we are building security in rather than frosting it on at the end. And how, much, how important is that? You know? And that becoming our standard operating procedure, how we create things, right? Is, uh, we, it's just something we have to do. And I think in the five to 10 years time frame, it's just gonna be standard practice instead of you know, these guys do it and those guys do it. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And um, so my big takeaway is software to find everything and the ability yeah. to, to kind of build to adapt and move stuff into the fleet. Any gentlemen want to add on to uh, that question? Yeah, I'd like to add on, uh, talk a little bit about augmented reality. A uh, 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 big part of augmented reality using object recognition. And, and currently there's limitations with hardware and software for augmented reality. And when you, you try to use the technologies and it can't, it can't recognize the object because maybe the object's a little bit different. It's a different, different lighting condition. Or, or there's a cable. There could be cables in front of the object. So what we're using, we're, we're actually at CACI, we're using machine learning to be able to look at an object, be able to recognize there's a, something that's blocking the object. It could be a cable, or it could be a, a different angle for the object, and to be able to do the object recognition so you can do your actual maintenance or training and things like that. So machine learning is becoming a big part of a lot of our technologies we're talking about, and actually you're going to hear that throughout our discussions today, that machine learning is a big part of enhancing a lot of things that we do. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, you know I'm going to be obviously speaking from the OEM perspective on some of this stuff, and when you think about it, from our perspective, what we're looking at for three key areas, reliability, making stuff smaller so it fits on the ships, right, and all the different places that we need to stick it out in the field, and uh, less power, right? How do we shrink things down and make them more cost effective from a power perspective, drive down co power costs? Um, and what's been interesting is there were a couple of things mentioned here already in this conversation which are, are key to what I say the wider conversation as we move forward. The commoditization of hardware, right, is critical because not only does that help us, right, we can build faster systems and make more complex systems and make them easier to deploy, but it also creates almost an arms race with our adversaries because that commoditized system also gives them access to those same types of tools. Right? Yep. So 
And later I'll get into the whole thing of COTS versus GOTS. Uh, COTS is absolutely the right way to go because that's how you get industry leading capabilities. Um, but you do sacrifice some of the challenge there because you're now using open standards that everybody else has access to as well. Um, and then the other area I'll touch on is I absolutely agree with uh, Matthew on the security element. Security needs to be a consideration at the beginning, at the beginning of the process versus later. The uh, executive order that came out last year on zero trust and uh, protecting the nation's infrastructure from a cybersecurity perspective. We often, of course, want to think about the warfighter at the tip of the spear and keeping them safe, but we also have to think about commercial industry and they need to be paralleling their efforts to protect our critical infrastructure. Uh, you look at what's going on in the Ukraine right now, um, the first, we, we don't know what's going on and where it's going to go, but we do know there are already reports of cyber attacks on the banks and on the military front facing um, websites and stuff like that. So figuring out how to get ahead of those things is going to be very interesting. Good. Hey guys, just a general reminder to get closer to your mics when you work oh. through. No, the answer was great. It just people want to. Hear I need. You. I need to get a little yeah, closer. Right. Like that. There we go. So Ramon, you're in the unenviable position of being cleanup. So I'm going to do you a favor, and I'm going to I'm going to give you a new question. How okay. About that? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I hate I hate that position because everybody else, you know, they they, they steal all the good you stuff. Have, and yeah. you're like, oh crap, what do I say? Oh, they you had know, good it's, stuff. It's I'm, good. I'm good with that. They're good. Well, so let's let's just piggyback on what they said. Um, so how do we design systems today? to be able to take advantage of all those advancements, right? We, how, how do we, you know, what can we do to ensure systems to, that we build today aren't obsolete tomorrow? I think that's right in your sweet spot. Right, so, it, you know, uh, adding on to what Matt said, software defined everything. So really, as you commoditize more and more hardware and you adopt these open standards, now the differentiation is gonna be on the software side. So how do you make that a possible? Uh, I am a huge proponent of using containers, containers uh, for microservices, and uh, that's made our life as developers just a lot easier. We deliver software, our software, other folks' software as containers. They can be integrated and they can uh, result in, in complete systems. So containers themselves are, are not the final answer. So I'm gonna hand you 25, 30 containers, go ahead and make a system. Uh, it's not done yet, right? So that's where container orchestration comes in. And you've probably heard of Kubernetes. So what is that? So, it, you know, give me those 25, 30 containers. If I need to create a system, there's a number of problems I haven't solved yet. How do I deploy them? How do I create a cluster? Uh, you know, multiple servers running those containers. What does my networking look like? How do I handle storage, scalability, uh, load balancing, uh, upgrades? It, if I didn't have a container orchestration capability like Kubernetes, guess what? I'm doing that myself. So uh, that's where something like container orchestration comes in. And eventually, uh, and, and by the way, it's not easy these days. It's still, Kubernetes is hard. You have, to, you, you have to have expertise to get that to work together. But eventually, that will become easier and it will ultimately be part of the operating system. You're gonna install your operating system and it'll come with a con container infrastructure and container orchestration really built in. So. Yeah, no, that's... Um that, that's that's exactly right, right? And I think we're seeing that across the board. Hey, maybe could you expand a little bit on open architectures and kind of our philosophy around those? Sure, so, um, uh, you know, open system architectures, it, it, it's more than a buzzword. Um, it really relies on uh, use of open standards on the hardware side. It's gonna be things like Vita 49, uh, uh, CMOS and SOSA, which you, you may have heard about. So various standards and, and uh, inter for interfacing to hardware. On the software th side, it's gonna be things like, um, uh, you know, the Open Container Initiative for standardizing container formats, uh, uh, message buses like ActiveMQ or Kafka. Um, so, so that's kind of one aspect of open system architectures. Another aspect is, is really embracing the ability to integrate 
components from the government or third party providers. That, that base platform needs to, um, needs to support that type of integration from, from the get go. And you know, this kind of ties back to, again, something Matt, Matt talked about with uh, DevSecOps. It, it really is from the beginning of the pipeline uh, uh, having that be part of your, op you know, that pipeline is building that open system architecture that enables that integration. Yeah, no, I, I think that's um, well said, and, and uh, again, the conversations of the day are how do we get away from the monolith of yesterday, right? The, 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 and I'm going to move to you next, Dan, so you're right on. I got a question that ties right into that, but the, the monolith of yesterday, you know, the software programs that are too big to fail, but take 10 years to go birth, and you know, in 10 years, technology changes so fast that, that you're working through that. So, so Dan, for you, you know, what's industry doing today to make this future reality? I think Dell's doing some fantastic things there, and interested in your uh, your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's very interesting. Like 10 years ago, you know, working in industry, uh, companies like Dell, like HP, and others, we kept our secrets very close to our chest on how we developed our hardware, how we you know, brought our features to the market because we wanted, of course, competitiveness. You want to keep your stuff better than everybody else's. But um, the government and their push to open standards and open requirements around that has really forced us in a good way, I think, to understand that we have to collaborate because what I would say is the continued growth of the cyber threat, the electronic warfare threat, has raised a new light on what we're really battling against, right? We could take all of the firepower in this room from a uh, electronics warfare perspective and put it together, and it still is dwarfed by the number of bad actors and bad players out there, which means we all need to work together twice as hard to be effective in developing solutions that are going to help protect our nation and protect our interests, right? So uh, what we're doing is, uh, I think Spectral is a great example of that, is working with our competitors in these scenarios to bring forward better standards and say, hey, have you guys thought about doing it this way? Because from a commercial standpoint, in our exposure to the wider market, this is what we're seeing. So we bring our commercial knowledge, which sometimes, as we always know, commercial spends money crazy, and they, they're, what I'd say is they're more accepting of newer technology. We bring that experience over to the federal government and we can then collaborate to establish new standards that help us stay ahead, like Ramon was talking about, of that, you know, of that curve. And, um, and a perfect example is, like I said, we're doing some work with NIST at the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence on uh, 5G security, and we're sharing things now, like with like our competitors and stuff up there, that there is no way we would have opened those books five, seven, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. That's good. One, one, one modulation on all that. We're partners. Yeah, And you absolutely. guys have been a fantastic partner in the, in the move to take you know, data to a decision point and put it to action. And I think that's the exciting part of, of, of what you said. And, and the, the partnership's been interesting because leveraging the great power of commercial technology, but bringing it into a high consequence space yes. that, that the, you know, if you go look at your, your cell phone and how apps get tested on your cell phone, they're basically crowd tested. You know, Apple fields a you know an 85% solution, and you get 10,000 people or you know 100,000 people looking at it. They get you know a whole bunch of changes in it. That doesn't work when you're in the high consequence space. And I think that combination of of legacy kind of insiders with commercial players like yourselves are really changing the game and moving it uh, to that next level. So I, I appreciate uh, uh, everything you said and. I figured I Excellent. had to pick on you just a little bit there. So Glad to. That's good. <laughs> hey, hey, Matt, anything to add on that? Um, so, yeah, Daniel, thank you. Because we are, we're riding that wave. You know, so as you guys are pushing, right, FPGAs are getting so much better and GPUs are getting so much better. And like I said, just even, uh, so there's a, there's a system that we make and we've realized, we've seen 
that we can evolve with the technology. So like I was describing, we started with, uh, we started with 10, 10 gig networking inside and then outside of the box. Well, we had some advancements that happened in, in FPGA processing, we incorporated that. Then we needed we needed 40 gig network pipes to be able to push the, to be able to push that right. So now we did that inside of a VPX system. However, guess what? Now we're going to do that using Dell rack mount servers and yeah. So and we're using 100, not not 40. So that's just kind of a you know a description or an example of how commercial is driving and we reap the benefit right because we don't have the kind of capital well you know how are we gonna how are we gonna make 100 gig into 200 right? We kind of rely on industry for that. Which yeah. was the limitation of GOTS back in the day right. when we were like, oh, we're all, you know, because I was there. Like, we're going to mm -hmm. build it ourselves. Everything is special made. And it just, it, from a research and development standpoint, it's just not tenable. Right. So. Right. Good. Good. These guys are all mad at me because I'm jumping through, jumping around on the questions that we told them <laughs> yeah. we were going to ask up at the front. <laughs> but keeping them on the hot seat, let's go to Dennis next, right? So, um, fantastic moves from a technology standpoint, uh, trying to employ software in different ways. Uh, everything from speed to sensors to those kind of things. But let's pivot. What about training, right? This is a big shift for uh, right. our military, and, and we're bringing a lot of technology uh, to bear. Um, what about training? As we add these new capabilities in the future, how do we minimize the burden on our warfighters? Well, like like I said, Todd, I mean, these new technologies are, are, are becoming over, are overburdening our technicians on board their ships. So we need to make... From number one standpoint, we need to make sure, like at, at at the schoolhouses, when we do the before they get to the ships, we need to give them the most effective training we can. And we have so much, so many great technologies now. I mean, using virtual reality and augmented reality and simulate combined with simulators, we can make sure when they actually get to where they need to get on the on board the ship, there's training as much, much as possible. Okay, so now when they get to the ship. Most important thing is embedded training is a really a really important topic. Um, in the past, you know, training is always an add-on. You add it on later. Well, if you if you add on training later, it's never effective. It needs to be part of the system. It needs to be developed as you develop the system. So the important thing is, as you're going through the, the development, training has to be part of your tactical builds. So when you develop your you actually deliver your tactical build to a ship, there has to be training integrated with that. All the new threats have to be integrated with those tactical builds. So embedded training is an important aspect of that. Yeah, fair enough. You got something to add, Dan? Yeah, um, training and simplification of the capabilities, right? Like how do you deploy these systems in the simple way as possible? Because every Marine's a warfighter, right? You may have an IT guy standing up there today who's sitting out in the field. Tomorrow it may be the cook who has to go and man that server because that's just how the mission works. And when I was in Quantico, I remember writing out instruction sets literally step by step, which means that that training you're talking about and that simplification is part of the security model. You have to be able to use those things effectively. If you type a wrong keystroke or pull a wrong lever, you can't affect the mission so I yeah spot on yeah hey so um, maybe Ramon uh, for you but I'm curious too uh, you know AI machine learning great buzzwords uh, I as a warfighter can probably get my head around what a missile is going to go do so um, a, a bob damage assessment or a projection of, of a, a kinetic weapon is pretty well known you can see it you can you can see it afterwards cyber you know uh, cyber effects are are quite a bit more nuanced uh, and then when you get into machine learn type of, you know, helping from a cognitive uh, standpoint, how do I trust what's going on? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, it, you know, quite a bit is being done on uh, being able to explain how those machine uh, learning and AI algorithms are actually working, right? How do they reach those conclusions? How do you validate the, uh, the answer, the, the algorithms? Um, it, you know, in, in systems we're building today, AI and machine learning are being used in a variety of ways, right? For training, for example, for helping uh, direct workflows in a, in, to, for operators, for maintenance, um, for and even deeper for signal processing. We're using uh, AI and machine learning to de de determine signal modulations and signal uh, types. Um, so, so yes, we, we, we need to emphasize 
how do we validate that those things are working correctly? And it, it, it's a difficult problem, but it's required going forward. Yeah, and I, I know in uh, many of the systems that you're fielding today with the machine learning that you're bringing to bear, you're building in confidence kind of factors and, and all that. That's Maybe exactly talk a little right. bit about that. Yeah, sure. So, so as you uh, try to better uh, identify a threat uh, based on multiple inputs, so kind of a da data fusion problem. Uh, um, so, you know, how do you determine what the confidence is in, in IDing that particular threat? That, that's something we're also working on at, at CACI, and uh, it, another difficult problem that, that we're, we're going to be working on. And Todd, that touches on something that you asked us too, like what does the Navy need to focus on, or, or really the wider DOD in the next 10 years? Data governance. Data governance is going to be critical to having effective AI. Being able to identify right. where that data came in, as soon as possible, classifying it and being able to build your AI models, models effectively. Correct. There is no lack of abundance of data, yeah. but being able to comb that data and effectively use it to build your AI models is probably the biggest challenge they have today. Yeah, absolutely. That well said, and, and there's a whole cottage industry I think about to be born in terms of data integrity yeah. uh, and AI integrity and, and how you trust what's actually happening. And once we start to trust those machine learn models, uh, somebody's going to get inside of those and, uh, and and change the game on us, and we're going to need to make Absolutely. sure that uh, there's a whole, you know, subset of cyber that we're working through to go play through it. But you know, that's a that's a great segue. Um, you guys have done a fantastic job, I think, painting a broad picture of uh, of of the state of technology and and kind of what we're working on, uh, moving into you know the Navy's near-term needs or or current needs when you go look at it. Um, great kind of perspective on what industry's doing, but what about the government? You know, what, what are we seeing uh, from, you know, examples of where the government is leaning forward, open architectures, training, adoption of, of new and evolving technologies, and maybe even more so, what more needs to be done, right? I think, I think you've touched on it, uh, but let's get, uh, let's get real here and maybe let's talk specifics about it. So who wants to jump in on that one first? Dennis Scott. Yeah, sure. Go for it. So, um, I think a big one I'm seeing right now is the, is the use of uh, the ANSI Vita 49.2 standard right now. Uh, government is pushing a lot of that in their RFPs, and I think that's great because it's really pushing forward uh, hardware and software development to a common standard, and it, it's making it easier for everyone to be marching on the same, on the same uh, plane for development, and it makes it easier for the developers to come up with this for so solutions and also for the third party developers to develop their solutions so they can be integrated into the overall systems a lot easier. No, yeah, and I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but um, in some of these RFPs that you're seeing, if, if you had looked at an RFP three, four, five years ago, the, the term container wouldn't show up anywhere, right? You, you, could, you could search for it, it wouldn't show up. And now, almost every one of these programs is saying container, container orchestration, open architectures. It, it's just been a, a, a very quick transformation. Cloud computing, all of those things are now sort of embedded in the way the, the government is, is looking at things going forward. I would say the way that, as well, like everyone's talking about RFPs and programs, the research and collaboration elements of the Navy and Army and other elements too has gotten much stronger. Instead of standing up a whole program and then throwing a bunch of money into the pit, they go, hey, let's bring all of you industry people together and have you guys make some investments here before we define this whole program and throw a bunch of money into the pit. Fair enough. So. Right. Uh, yeah, so exactly kind of what Ramon was saying about containers. So, yeah, several years ago, they weren't asking for containers. We were using them, though, right? <laughs> <We're> just, <laughs> um, and... Uh, something that I have observed, especially recently, I mean, Spectral Prime example, is the government is getting much, much better about putting the parameters around what open architecture is. And I'll even go one step further where we're actually being evaluated. Actually, I just got done remotely supporting uh, an open, a no kidding open architecture evaluation for a down select contract, right? Years ago, that was you know basically unheard of. You know, How do you evaluate for open architecture? Well now, guess what? I'm gonna show up with a third party capability and they're gonna build to the API or the specs that you defined, pick your, pick your standard, and if it doesn't work, you don't, you know, you didn't, you didn't, uh, it's not open, right? In the years past, 
being open was a check in the box, you know? Or did you use OMS? Did you use VPX, right? Uh, by inspection, check, right? Now we can actually, you know, test for these things. Yeah, no, hey, I, I uh, think, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dennis. I, I was gonna say, and containers are fun. If you yeah. have uh, <laughs> yeah. worked in the software world, you uh, know, and have the scars to prove it, when you get to containers, it, it, it is fun. It, it's, it's just a, a good way of doing yeah. things. Well, and it, it solves, it's, it can help solve a lot of problems that we've been dealing with for a long time. I mean, Ramon, we were kind of kicking it yesterday talking about the old, well, it works on my machine, you know, which is a, yeah. kind of a standard software developer thing. Well, um, you know, containers are, you know, deploy anywhere and they're incredibly repeatable. So um, we're slowly weaning out the, well, it works on my machine, you know, kind of concept. And we can translate that to our customers when we deliver. Right? So the exact same thing that I'm using to build with or that I'm deploying, right? here's my package that I'm going to deliver to you, right? and it's consistent. Yep. Yeah. So, so DevSecOps is coming into its, uh, its new right. Um, containers are fun. I like that we got Ramon <laughs> excited, so that, that's good. That's great. That's as excited as he gets, guys. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, so Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, so one thing I was just going to add, so why are we doing this? Not Obviously, it's fun, but also build build it once, build it once, but use it across multiple platforms. So you may build it for an NRO program, and the same container maybe could be used for a Navy program. So build it once, use it multiple times. Makes it easier for the OEM, makes it easier for our customers. Yeah, so I was going to follow up. Uh, I, I do see a huge inflection point in how the government is leveraging software and building uh, to, to a DevSecOps principle. Maybe we can talk a little bit about software factories because I think that's the next new buzzword and what are your thoughts on the various software factories across the government? Because to realize a build once, deploy anywhere type of construct, there has to be some, some underpinning or at least some forethought in terms of how, how we go about that. So uh, maybe Ramon, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this. We'll go start with you. Uh, sure, so, uh, you know, so, so adopting those DevSecOps uh, principles and agile development methodologies and uh, use of containers, um, those are all good, you know, good things and the government is trying to standardize uh, in various ways uh, how those things are developed. That DevSecOps, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, CICD pipeline. Um, and they have sprouted multiple uh, of these environments and it, over time, you can imagine that there's going to be some consolidation there. But it, it is a it, it's a it's a good thing, and it's a, a good learning process for us as providers and and the government as, as well. So I, I think it's just my opinion. I think it's a good thing for now, and it's it's part of the maturation process of uh, of those development me methodologies. No, yep, fair enough. How about as a software insider? Uh Dan, if you have any thoughts from Dell's perspective on software factories? Uh, I would say probably, you know, from our perspective, it, 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 you know, when you look at it from the OEM space, we're highly focused on supply chain, right? So how do we ensure and protect the, you know, because everyone thinks of, like you guys talking about the containers and up above the application. There's a bunch of software that runs, you can commoditize your hardware as much as you want, still software running inside of those things. So from our perspective, we're continually working to try to figure out how to protect BIOS, how to protect firmware, ensure the resiliency of that. Uh, we were talking about the future. Some of the things that you know we're working on it would be advanced telemetry to keep track of those elements and look at how you get to a self-healing perspective in the next five to 10 years, yes. where you identify problems in the system and failover before you have a failure, right? right. Use your, your redundancy right. to help you. Uh, where you get to the point where if you have something that's acting out of normal, then you segregate it, but you are able to keep the entire system running. And I think that plays into the supporting the ideals and structures of the, of the software factories. Good. Good. Yep. yep. So, yeah, the, so the so yeah, we're using the software factories. Um, so, and, uh, so shift left. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a couple of things here. So one, the, the shift left that we get to realize through using the software factories, right, because of what we inherit. So uh, Iron Bank is one of the software factories. It's a, it's a container registry. And what we pull out of that container registry are certified hardened containers. So 
what that means is we're starting with these packages that are already hardened, they already have ATOs, right? That's where we're starting from. So now, when we are bringing something new that we're gonna test with, we're just, we, all we have to do is certify that delta, right? How much faster are we getting to our ATO, getting to our no kidding secure solution, right? Because we only have to worry about this piece instead of, instead of the whole darn thing, yeah. right? The other thing that I'm gonna talk about is, you know, the software factories are really dominated by infrastructure as code, okay? Mm -hmm. so, we now get to inherit all of this infrastructure that's been stood up and done for us in a secure way, right? So we're now starting so much farther ahead than we were before, right? Because of really what the community is providing to us. Yeah, yeah no, I think um, one of the exciting awesome. things about this team, and I'm, I'm kind of um, wishing the Northrop guy was here, because I think you've done a fantastic job of pulling the classic OEM kind of construct of monolithic software into the future. And, and I think it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have this hybrid of a, you know, kind of best in class across the board, you know, anchored by Dell's commercial stuff, uh, the CACI, the SNC, you know, kind of subject matter expertise, and then getting to the high end, um, you know, top side type of things of, of Northrop and, and working them in. And, and you guys have done a fantastic job. Uh, with with kind of navigating and all that and, and putting together something I think that's uh, uh, really better than the sum of its parts. So I applaud you for that. Well, hey, just to add on to that, because I do want to sing those praises too for companies like Northrop, Lockheed, and others, yeah, is, the, is the fact that where do we get all of our stuff from experience and industry? And those companies have been working with the federal government since before time. Sure, of course. <laughs> so all of that experience has helped them help us understand how to shape and drive to, to support the mission, yeah. so. Good. Okay, so um, I've got some additional questions here, but I was gonna throw it to the audience. Anybody have uh, has some thoughts or questions for this uh, this panel to, <coughs> to tackle? Mm. I'm gonna get a bunch of blank stares, and Mike's got one. What do you have, Mr. Loomis? Yeah, there's a mic back here. Yeah. Or you can yell. You guys started the, the panel talking a lot about security and security of some technologies. I, I'm with Nokia. Uh, one of the technologies that, that's near and dear to us is 5G. And if I've looked at how some of uh, these 3GPP systems have evolved, um, 5G is pretty secure. We're part of that same NIST program as that you mentioned earlier. Um, if I think about the topic of the panel and the evolution of uh, signals intelligence, um, as we make these systems more secure, there's a corresponding impact on our ability to maybe gather intelligence about some of those systems that are out there. I'm wondering if the panelists could comment on the ebb and flow of that, the, you know, how does us building more inherent security into some of this technology impact the other mission and how are we evolving in that, that push-pull in the life cycle? Yeah, that's a great question. Anybody want to tackle yeah. that? I'll, 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 Go ahead. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll start, right? So yeah, all right, our, our adversaries, right, today, and thinking about the most complex threats of today and where they're likely gonna be able to go tomorrow, right? We, are, we now need to be able to do ultra-wideband signal processing, right? Tons of data, right? And things like advancements in system-on-chip, the next generation of FPGAs, right, are gonna help us, are gonna help us get there, okay? All right, kind of losing track here. Um, <laughs> you guys pick up for me. I think. Uh, um, do you want to pick? You got it? Well, Mike's go coming ahead. back. Go ahead. For, for, go ahead. Well, I'll oh. wait for the answer, but I, I may have a follow-on question yeah. to your comment yeah. there. Cause so, it, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so, right, so, uh, yeah, larger instantaneous bandwidth, so more, right, so more RF spectrum at once, right, more sensitivity, better DF, so we can kind of sort these, sort these things on. I'm thinking about kind of a, particular problem here but yeah so we need better we need better receivers and better processing at the other end right? and I will add Matt you actually said something earlier that's critical here too and that was building security in at the beginning as part mm -hmm. of the design makes it less cumbersome right we have a huge challenge right now where everybody throws something out there and then go we got to secure it to get to ATO right. so the stuff like the software factories you were talking about where you receive an element that's already secured 
you just talked about it. It right. saves you tons of time and you don't have to then hurdle that gap. Right, so right. security at the beginning and making it less intrusive as part of the design requirement is going to be critical. Get a follow up? Yeah, you, you commented about the need to process uh, in ultra wideband and the impact that that's going to have on yeah. the systems and the need to drive some of that back into hardware. You know, another raging deba debate that occurs in our industry is network function virtualization. And when I get in a room and talk to some of our developers about that, um, you know, they get kind of frustrated with it at times because putting these network functions onto general purpose uh, um, processors doesn't necessarily simplify the system at all. Um, and sometimes can create some inefficiencies in the system when you're trying to operate these things at a um, uh, very, very high performance like you kind of described. Mm -hmm towards the middle of the session there was most of the talk was started to come in around how we were going to use a lot of these software defined techniques to advance this do you see this coming back to where you need to drive it back into hardware at some point so i'll go back to i'll go back to software defined hardware enabled right so we 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 ride the hardware as it is as it is available and as it's necessary cuz changing hardware is expensive and it takes a long, and it takes a takes a a lot of time, right? Now, of course, like we said, we're building into our systems now the ability to inc incorporate the next generation of hardware, but we want to solve that stuff with software first, right? So, in the kind of solutions that we build that are, you know, signal, right, RF signal processing focused, what we do, we've built an ecosystem where we pair that specialized processing, an FPGA or system on chip or GPU kind of processing with x86 processing, right, because we need both. You know, so we're passing the kind of functions and the kind of stuff that can be done into x86 processing there, right? But no kidding, there's stuff we're, we're, we still have to do and we're probably always going to have to do in that, you know, specialized kind of processing. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think the, um, what you're talking or asking, Mike, it's the, it's the root problem underneath joint all, all domain command and control because you've got an existing as, install base. You can't go necessarily switch out every piece of kit on an F16 but you still got to talk to an F-35 and you got to you know, for take that forward to the hypersonic weapon that you might need or whatever, and you're dealing with this just kind of conflated set of, of hardware that goes back 30 years. So I, I think some of the things that we're seeing is stitching it together <coughs> in software to allow you know, the, the bridge across that, but, but there are, and maybe we should pivot to that after we get through the audience in terms of advances in technology too, because there's hardware, there's hardware focus that we have across the, across the board as well. Good, good question. Good morning, Jerry Burroughs from SNC. So, uh, on any peer fight we may get into, we're going to see signals and threats on day one that we weren't expecting. Can you talk about how your architecture would enable a response to those threats and maybe how rapid that response might be? Ramon, maybe uh, you can take that on? I didn't quite hear the yeah, question. I think the question was. Get their question repeated? Yeah, the question was um, it, uh, paraphrasing. You know, when we get into tomorrow's fight, we may encounter things in the spectrum that we haven't seen before, right? So, so the uh, the counterinsurgency fight was pretty simple. You knew what was coming at you. You knew how to go defeat it. You had months or years to go build a solution. But what happens when you're in the middle of the Pacific and you see a new signal coming at you? How do you go sure. adapt? Yeah. So, so that gets into um, how quickly you can analyze the new threat and develop a countermeasure against it and how quickly you can deploy that on, on ships. And, uh, it, you know, I'll go back to containers, right? You can, they're, they're much smaller packages that you can deploy over the air, assuming you have some level of connectivity to, um, uh, you, you know, to, to ships in, in, in a strike group, for example. And if it's an open architecture, you'll deploy them in a way that can be quickly integrated into the existing system, right? And it will uh, roll out live, meaning you won't have to take the system down to add a new capability. It will, uh, it will be automatically integrated, you know, with an over-the-air update into an existing system. So I think there, there are uh, ways of doing that, and I think the Navy is, is going to lean forward on those types of requirements in the future. And we'll also be fighting tomorrow's wars with tomorrow's technology, right? There's a lot of advancement going on. One of the areas that's really interesting to me is like quantum sensing, right? 
the capability to leverage that technology to identify and measure airflow and movements and environmental factors to pick up things that we wouldn't even dream of seeing on today's sensors for early detection and response is going to be critical. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Another and question? Yeah. There we go. You guys uh, started off by talking about where things are heading in the next sort of five to 10 years. I was sort of curious if you had thoughts about where those same relevant technologies are heading in like 15 or 20, a little further out kind of thing. You know, what should we be expecting with those systems that have to live on ships for the next yeah, 20, so 30 years? What's the 15 year out environment? Dan, you, you set the table on that, but new technologies are coming into play, certainly quantum, but what do we, what are we, what are we, what do we have in the drawing board and what's 15 years out look like? You know, uh, you know what keeps me up at night, and, and this is—it's a critical subject, but it's a boring subject. But again, I'm talking from the OEM, piece, OEM perspective: is uh, it, it's what enables technology, which is supply chain. Uh, when everyone looks at what's going on in in the world right now, everyone thinks that oh, it's you know we need access to seaports or we need access to uh, you know to to oil. No, no, no. We need access to rare metals to build all of the chips, to support all of this infrastructure and build all this wonderful technology. Uh, supply chain is going to be a critical issue now and is going to continue to grow in the next 15 to 20 years. Um, there is a lot, you know, talking about what is government doing to help. The government is doing large funding to start trying to figure out how to drive more chip, chip manufacturing in the yeah. United States. But getting access to the elements to build that stuff is going to be critical. So. Uh, supply chain to me is, I know it's not an exciting topic, but it should be. <laughs> Fair enough. Right. And gosh, the things that we're, I'm going to kind of tie a little bit back to the last question, kind of the things that we're doing with artificial intelligence and machine learning now, mm -hmm. right, where we're doing, so things like, uh, you know, signal recognition or, you know, uh, parameter characteriz characterization is happening. We're uh, it's kind of in, happening in labs right now, so it's probably going to re be reality in you know five five some years, mm -hmm. right? Where that stuff is now happening better and faster in labs, and we're probably going to see that out in the field in years to come. And uh, so, where that sort of technique and a new way of doing it in the next five to ten, you know, five twenty years, holy cow, right? Uh, and then. You know, as the computer science guy, you know, that far out, start thinking about quantum computing, right? And what that's going to mean to cryptography, right? Mm. And gosh, so potentially our and our adversaries' ability to just break crypto when that sort of, when that sort of technology becomes you know, readily available, right? Yeah, oh. no, well said, yeah. well said. Sir? Hey, thank you. Uh, my name's Angel Messa. So as it relates to mach machine learning, just a good dovetail off what you were talking about, as it relates to the metrics utilized to uh, measure machine learning performance, algorithmic performance, um, what, what are some of the areas that you're, you're looking at to ensure and understand the left and right parameters of model performance? And then really, as it relates to adoption of AI for DOD, how are we being able to depict, or portray that model performance so we understand um, how to employ a model or, uh, and based off the operating environment um, associated to uh, deployment. Yeah. Do you want to take that one, Dennis? Yeah, I think actually Ramon mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, I think our, one of the metrics is confidence, your confidence factors, right? right. So if, if you're an operator and you pick up a signal and you're not sure if that signal is the, it, it matches to your database, you'll be provided with a confidence level whether or not of how, what level it actually matches. So confidence level is one of the metrics. I don't know, is there anything else? Availability of data. Um, the, the DOD, we, there's massive amounts of data, but actually sharing it and figuring out how you're talking about how to build a confidence factor in that to build your model effectively is, is, is a challenge right now because everything's compartmentalized. Now, I'm not, there's lots of practical reasons it should be, right? Nobody's... Uh, saying there isn't, but it does create a challenge there, right? Like how do you get this data and securely and effectively do the analysis to create the confidence factor to establish your models and, and yeah. Yeah, and, and establishing boundaries around what this particular algorithm or system can do and what it can't do. 
-hmm. You know, how good is it at recognizing certain threat signals or certain threat uh, uh, environments, or and where you, where it drops off, and you know, maybe uh, it, you know the user is sure. is now involved in in that decision making. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. And d just as a comeback, then. I know each type of data is different, right? So there's not a cookie cutter solution, and, and, that, and that is the challenge, right? Yeah. But right. as you think about um, understanding uh, the data performance and understanding that data, is there a way to, to portray, it, to establish a baseline, a building block approach to therefore build from, whether it's tabular, SAR, you know, full motion video, what have you? Is there, is there a way to focus and establish a benchmark because I think the, the key challenge is for AI adoption is understanding from the higher up leadership that grew up on acetate maps, and now we're doing everything on a visual in the cloud command post. H how do we establish that benchmark to have a conversation that, hey, my model can do this and can do that, but it can't do this, but it works for this environment, let's go for it and make that decision. So that's, yeah. that's what, uh, simplifying it from Cert that aspect. Cer certainly, I think one of the challenges facing us today, right, and to do it with, with the, uh, the ethics and morals of the United States behind it, you know, meaning that you're, you've got absolute confidence that you have a person in the loop and you're working through it, I think that's the, the challenge we need to go work through. These guys are all working on digital twins and, and doing full up modeling simulation with, with actual real physics, so the, so the synthetic environments We've gotten pretty sophisticated to where we can do a lot of that iteration, roll that into our training regimes, roll that into our mission preparation, and, and work through that as well. But I, I think you're hitting on it, sir. This is a this is a big challenge for us to figure out, you know, how to move into into the next war. So so thank you for yeah, that. Thank you, thank yeah. you. I think yeah. um, if we got one more real quick question, and we're coming to the end, so I'll take one more, and then we'll we'll wrap up. So please, right, gentlemen. Um, so the, the DOD published the uh, AI training education strategy that outlines different levels of the AI workforce and developing an AI workforce. We largely have AI creators pushing stuff down to users, and there's not a lot of address in between. Uh, the DOD is working on creating that technician level, middle ground workforce. So my question to the industry is, what is the industry doing to include access to AI models to manage and monitor these systems for their commanders on the ground at the tactical edge? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I've got thoughts, but if you got something done, I, th I think, well, I'll answer it then. And I, you know, I'll take the last question from the podium and we'll go with that. But um, I think AI is going to be very much like the journey that the military's been on with cyber, right? And it took us literally probably 15 years to roll in you know, uh, a, a cyber mission and, and get the training regimes and get the con ops and kind of work through all those. Um, probably going to be more difficult with AI because it's going to be one of those that are a little bit more nuanced and get into confidence intervals. But if you look at, if you look at taking cyber effects to the DOD, it's sort of that same challenge of how do I trust this? Again, my, my analogy, you know what a missile's going to do, you know what a bullet's going to do. You've seen that for, for the last, you know, 10 years, 50 years, 1,000 years, depending on the kinetic effect that you're putting onto it. How do you trust something that happens in software? How do you do the battle, battle damage assessment or the reverse? How do you trust the, the cognitive help you're getting from, uh, from your AI? And, and how do you go work through it um, with a bunch of you know, old soldiers, old sailors you know, that, are, that are out there um, and, and they learned in that kinetic fight. So I think it's probably going to be one of those generational things as the military moves through it, just like we did in cyber and some of the other I'm going to say exo, that's not the right word, but the more fuzzy, the fuzzy spaces that we're in, right? And, and that's a perfect segue to, to close out because we, we intended, these guys all had hardware components to it, but Matt started us off with, you know, it's, it's really about software defined everything and taking uh, a piece of hardware into, I, I don't care if it's a ship or, or putting it on a sailor or, or putting it on an airframe, that's a almost 10 year cycle to get through all of the, uh, the confidence and uh, uh, the, the checks and balances that, that need to happen. We are today in a world where we can deploy software and, and I've been on programs, we've done it in, in as few as a couple of hours since identification of need to Ramon's uh, a point on it to where you've got the ATO in place, you have a dev development environment that's uh, 
uh, identical to your operations environment with the proper security overlay, re really unpacking DevSecOps, mm -hmm. you can get to speed. Um, we are taking hardware that's out there today, so you take a radar, uh, you know, yesterday's radar was, uh, you, you sent out a, a signal, you, you, you took that return. We're turning radars, because of software, into full spectrum sensors, uh, taking SIGINT to the next level, working through all of that. Uh, I think cyber's coming into its own right. I, I, I could go on for another hour on, on cyber and where we're at, but I think uh, you know, we have uh, put the infrastructure in place to pay attention to it. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got cyber warriors embedded within every command structure. Uh, I am concerned at the vulnerability of our, uh, our, our weapon systems out there, and I think there's more work to be done on that, and I know the NDAs of, uh, of recent years are focusing on it, but when you got a, uh, you know, you look at the Air Force guys, I'll pick on them, a B-52 that's, uh, that's been flying since the 50s and is gonna fly till the 50s. I mean, that's a crazy <laughs> type of uh, a moniker to go look at it. So, um, software-defined everything, uh, we, we talk through you know, uh, Dennis and, and, uh, and others, the cognitive uh, load that, that we're putting on our, our sailors at this point and, and, and working through that. Um, again, making better use of technology, certainly in augmented and, and virtual reality, digital twins driving through, uh, through all of that. Um, you know, our, our friend from Dell, um, you know, I think very aptly uh, described the, uh, the various leverage points that we're taking on the commercial side and um, uh, very much happy that the commercial industry is making uh, a, uh, a, a big push into technology development. And in my lifetime, and many of you in the audience, we've shifted from uh, the DOD being the, uh, the single biggest investor in technology uh, to the software industry and the commercial industry to doing that. And I think we are coming into a new, uh, a new day in terms of how we leverage that and driving it. And I think this team is doing a fantastic, uh, a fantastic play at that. And then uh, Ramon's uh, kind of coverage of uh, open architectures and uh, what'd you say, containers are fun. Um, we're, we're gonna go double down on that. But I think uh, leveraging new software or, or modern software practices in that DevSecOps uh, and taking it full circle to in a world of software to find everything, I think is a, uh, a pretty exciting time. And guys, I, I, uh, I'm super proud of you. You did a fantastic job covering a bunch of difficult, difficult topics. Um, uh, we did cover a lot of topics, so thank you for that. Uh, thanks everybody out here uh, uh, for listening. I do have those Navy jokes, so uh, when, you, when you see me later in the hallway, we'll, uh, we'll share those with you as well. But thanks again, everybody. Thanks. thanks. Thank you.